everyone, it's Mrs. Wallace. I just want to give you this uh, quick video to give you an introduction to the progressive era. This video is really going to focus more on kind of American life in the time period uh, as progressive reform begins. And uh, just to give you some photographs, some visuals of what life was like and um, introducing some of the kind of ways in which societies organized. We've already looked at the uh, Gilded Age. So we already know that there's a great deal of challenges for Americans in terms of um, the issues of corporate power and growing, you know, gaps between rich and poor and conditions in American cities. Uh, but there's also some ways in which we start to see some uh, changes. And the changes also will create um, a lot of reform efforts that come from, in a lot of cases, local uh, and, you know, state um you know, kind of levels, uh, but there also will become like a more national uh, progressive uh, reform movement. And that's where we're really headed uh, to look at in class. Um, a few things that we can note in terms of just to kind of connect to some of the Gilded Age, you know, we know that there were um, various ways that groups of people tried to uh, solve some of the issues of, um, you know, for example, consolidated corporate power, uh, the rise of unions, and uh, some of the early efforts um, in some cases led to, you know, increased violence, a great deal of labor strikes, for example. But by the turn of the century, we do see some successes uh, for labor unions. Uh, we also see um, some ways in which uh, Americans kind of develop uh, some increase in disposable income. Uh, and this is not going to be for everyone. The reality is there are certain industries that see more of an increase. For example, skilled labor like steel workers are going to experience greater rise in wages than say, for example, you know, women working in textile. So it's not even, and there are many groups that become excluded from this like increase in disposable income, but we do see a rising um, level of um, income for some uh, groups and maybe even a increase in what we would kind of describe as like an American middle class. By the turn of the century, we start to see that there are growing numbers of what we would call like white collar workers, you know, people, accountants or, um, you know, doctors, lawyers, uh, that particular uh, group of workers is getting larger. Uh, there's also a movement within the labor unions to fight for eight hour workday, which is largely successful. So this like space that is not work and is not sleep uh, becomes um, a space for leisure, which is um, creating opportunities for like mass leisure, you know, kind of culture in uh, uh, American spaces. And that is something that is uh, notable, was not necessarily the case uh, before this time. And you also have, you know, leisure uh, and the spaces of leisure that become very, you know, kind of distinct based on um, gender based on uh, race, ethnicity, uh, class. Okay. So we'll, we'll look at that really briefly in this. Uh, one example of kind of a leisure activity would be Coney Island in Brooklyn. It is a huge kind of, um, uh, recreation spot. It is an amusement park, um, literally a space to go to be amused, right? To feel, uh, happy. It is an outlet for lots of, uh, working class, uh, Americans who are spending days, you know, in kind of the industrial factory. Uh, this becomes a space uh, one day a week to be able to um, kind of congregate with people who um, you share this experience with. Uh, there's a beach at Coney Island. There's also an amusement park. So uh, it's inexpensive and people uh, take um, a trolley car, you know, to get there. And it ultimately is a uh, huge uh, opportunity for recreation, um, kind of get a sense of the uh, experience, you know, of um you know, the, uh, the experience of Coney Island and kind of what it represents as this, um, uh, alternative, right. To, to work. Um, Nathan's hot dogs gets its start. You can see like the ice cream soda, malted milkshake, potato chips. Um, these stands for food. Lots of what we would recognize today is kind of leisure activity as people congregate, you know, beaches or things like that. Uh, that's what people are starting to experience. Um, and this becomes an outlet again for a lot of industrial workers. Um, another uh, outlet would be um, vaudeville theaters. And there's lots of theaters that pop up in places like 
like New York City, for example, some of the theaters have ethnic uh, components to them. So, you know, Italian theaters, uh, Yiddish theaters, where there is um, uh, kind of familiarity uh, culturally in terms of language. Uh, but there's also this popular um, type of um, like talent show, uh, one act type things that are like, you know, it, people would pay five cents, stay for a really long time and just see a series of acts. You know, the seats inside were like benches uh, and maybe a hundred people could like sit in a theater like this and watch um, a variety of different acts. And vaudeville was like, you know, funny, but very, very uh, popular uh, type of entertainment in this time period. You do get uh, Central Park, which is this massive um, park that's kind of built right into the city space uh, for the purpose of trying to create some space that's going to be uh, green. Um, Olmsted, this becomes kind of a uh, very, very um, huge initiative uh, to try to create some uh, green space, but it also does have kind of a class uh, component to it. Lots of upper class uh, New Yorkers would get dressed up and maybe walk uh, and promenade, you know, in certain sections of Central Park. So despite the fact that it's like a public space, the use of the public space becomes very um, organized by class. So we can see in this image kind of what would be more like middle class, upper class uh, Americans who aren't congregating in the same space with like working class Americans who are seen, you know, as, uh, you know, not the same. And so the progressive era in general is going to be kind of tainted by some of these uh, class issues and also issues of um, uh, race and uh, gender. On one hand, we get a great deal of reforms, um, people who are going to take on trying to um, kind of enable others in society to succeed, maybe rejecting social Darwinism a little bit. Uh, but there's also going to be these efforts that are, you know, in some ways uh, projecting uh, middle class, you know, values and lifestyles, you know, on other groups. You know, what does it mean to be American? There's certain um, images of what that is. And that's been a theme throughout the Gilded Age. We see that in the progressive era, too. It doesn't really go away. Uh, the Nickelodeon, this is another um, theater. Uh, this becomes a very inexpensive way for people to watch uh the pictures, right? So as movies start to develop, the very first movies are going to be, you know, basically, you know, images of anything that moves, you know, waterfall or whichever. Uh, but very quickly, there become uh, particular uh, films that even uh, without having sound in them, uh, they are incredibly uh, popular and people will uh, come to the Nickelodeons to watch uh, the movies and uh, very, very popular. Uh, we also see sports. So uh, baseball develops at this time as a huge, huge pastime. Um, there's a great deal of um, popularity uh, with football at the college level. Football really kind of comes about um, at universities and, you know, is played without any equipment at all. Initially, there's some like horrific football accidents, um, I don't know if they're accidents, but football uh, injuries and the, um, uh, you know, group of colleges ultimately uh, make decisions to um, create, uh, you know, headwear and, um, you know, other uh, forms of padding to protect some of the players. Uh, we also see basketball rise up at this time and uh, boxing, which is done in quite a few circles, you know, without for at first, you know, boxing gloves, you know, boxing is done kind of knuckle to knuckle. Uh, but eventually uh, it becomes a sport that has particular rules and whatnot, you know, with boxing gloves and a ring and a particular layer. So we see a lot of sports actually develop in this time with some uh, more specific rules and crowds that are going to watch those particular uh, sports, okay? Uh, women start to participate in sports, in particular uh, tennis and golf, uh, but we do see a rise in interest in uh, female activity. You know, prior to the 1900s, there really was a view that exercise was literally dangerous for women, uh, that women could be harmed, their bodies, their physical bodies would be harmed. Um, by the turn of the century, there's a lot of pushback against that and women who are seeking uh, to participate, you know, actively in sports. And we get 
um, interesting, you know, kind of uh, connections to uh, what women are wearing when they're bicycle riding or playing tennis and things like that. So at this time, there's still a great deal of modesty in women's clothing and uh, even bathing suits are lengthy. They are, um, you know, very, very uh, much covering up uh, women's bodies. Um, that starts to change with the advent of women participating in a variety of activities that were uh, previously kind of excluded uh, for women. Uh, we also get um, a lot of uh, leisure that is connected to the urban lifestyle um, and in some cases really segregated by um, uh, ra uh, by uh, gender and uh, by uh, class of uh, the saloon would be a really good example saloons pop up you know on every single street in American cities they often have um, connections to ethnic communities and to the political uh, happenings of those ethnic communities so like the saloon is the place to go to find out about you know the the political machine and what types of opportunities might be available to one, you know, by accessing the political machine. So communities kind of have their local political hotspots, uh, but saloons also become magnets for um, working class uh, men. And in some cases, some of the progressive reforms are going to be about uh, trying to push back against like what um, uh, saloon culture is all about, which includes, you know, not only um, alcohol and high rates of drinking, uh, but also kind of a culture of, um, you know, uh, political uh, dissent and also a culture of, um, you know, in some cases, you know, fighting and brawls, you know, between members of community and things like that. So saloons kind of get uh, their own uh, space and generally are not a middle class pursuit, but something uh, pursued by the working classes. Um, we see city streets become like, it's like BCA hallway culture. We all kind of know what that means. Um, BCA hallway culture is like where people kind of go to express themselves. And it's like, you know, kind of a space that gets defined by the people who, you know, literally live in it. And uh, in the time of the turn of the century, you know, city streets uh, for people who have little uh, economic resources uh, and some time, like newfound time, uh, that extra eight hours in the day that's going to be dedicated to leisure is spent with one's, you know, people on the city street. So in the rural communities, this is front porch culture, people kind of congregating on each other's front porches. In the city, this is street culture, right? Kids playing in the streets, you know, women walking in the streets, people kind of um, living a lot of their lives literally with other people uh, in the streets. Uh, we do get uh, changes in American art as a result of some of the changes in society. Uh, there is this huge growing uh, movement of artists known as the Ashcan School of Art, and they actually host a huge show in the early 1900s known as the Armory Show. Uh, but one of the things that we note, this is a George Bellows um, work of art. Uh, he's a painter. Um, we see this kind of move to uh, more like grimy <laughs> type of themes. This is a boxing ring, right? Somebody's getting punched in the face. You know, it's kind of a urban moment uh, type of, um, you know, art because it's expressing some of the things that are kind of happening uh, in society. It speaks to the real. There's a great deal of efforts to kind of make this uh, a little bit more realistic and get away from like genteel type of paintings of like pretty, you know, landscape themes or things like that. This is more of a, you know, kind of in your face, what is life like uh, type of thing, right? Somebody's just getting pelted and, you know, thrown to the, to the, side. Uh, that's kind of speaks to uh, American society at the time. So enter in the progressives, right? We're going to see a great deal of movement um, in a variety of forms. And the big takeaway is progressivism isn't just one thing. It's like a whole marching, you know, idea of reform, some of which are more successful than others. Some are local, some are national, uh, but we do see a great deal of um, role for the government. That's what this is really all about. Kind of rejecting the idea that, you know, social Darwinism can solve problems or that uh, there's any other type of market force that can actually address the problems in society. This is going to be, you know, the government has to play an active role on the ground in creating, you know, greater uh, rules, you know, for capitalism. That's essentially uh, what this is about. And this will be the last uh, slide. Some things that we really can um, say are things that tie together um, most progressives, despite the fact that some are going to be fighting for the vote for women. Some like W.E.B. Du Bois are looking for 
um, an end to segregation for uh, Black Americans. Some, uh, you know, progressives are going to be looking to bash the monopoly. So it's got a lot of different uh, pieces, some common characteristics. Um, definitely a desire for order. This is something that, you know, lots of um, middle class Americans start to look around and see that maybe society in some spaces um, are creating like social instability, uh, chaos, you know, those saloon brawls in the middle of the night. So some of this is about a cleanup of society, which has, you know, uh, in some ways, some benevolent aspects to it, and in some ways, some not so benevolent aspects to it, as middle class Americans maybe are trying to clean up society in their own image. Uh, lots of local movements that grow to national efforts. Um, progressivism is rooted in this idea of progress, um, that you know, if this is not an end to capitalism, it's not socialism, but it is human intervention on the government stage that's going to enable growth to continue in a way in which that's going to be uh, good for members of society. It's definitely anti-monopoly. That's a huge theme. Uh, there is a very large faith in um, knowledge and science. Uh, this is going to be like kind of like what we would call today data driven. Um, and we see the advent of lots of professions in this time. Uh, doctors become grouped up in the American Medical Association. Um, other uh, professions kind of take on a particular um, uh, license, a particular definition um, and have a role in society, right? So knowledge uh, gets really a, a big kind of um, uplift in the uh, progressive era. And of course, um, you know, lots of people are going to reject social Darwinism and the idea that, you know, it is not the people's fault in the way in which, say, for example, poverty exists. It is about the environment. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop this here and uh, I will see you in class on Monday.